Hello, and welcome to another edition of In the Loop. I'm Peter McGinn, Assistant Superintendent of the Wilmington Public Schools. In the Loop is a show that provides information about what's going on in the Wilmington Public Schools. This edition of In the Loop will focus on Wilmington's Coordinated School Health Program. I'd like to introduce you to three individuals who are focused on the health and well-being of Wilmington students. First, on my far right, is Mary Palin, who is the administrator of the Wilmington Public Schools Food Services. Nice to have you here today, Mary. Thank you. Uh, next to Mary on her left is Laura Stinson, who coordinates the curriculum for physical education and health in grades K through 12. And then to my immediate right is Doreen Crow, who is the school district's school nurse leader. Welcome, Doreen, Laura, Mary. Thank you, Peter. Mary, let's start, let's start with you. Um, what advice do you have for parents who are trying to get their children to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables? Um, well, one of the things that I've found that sometimes works is if you take children to the, the grocery store and you're struggling with them at home eating fresh fruits and vegetables, take them to the grocery store and let them pick and choose what they'd like to try. Sometimes when you're picking it out, you might pick one thing they might pick something else. Also try a selection. Try varying things. Don't just always go for the Macintosh apple or a delicious apple. Try a green apple. Um, everyone's tastes and preferences are different. And don't give up because they don't necessarily like something today. They might like it tomorrow. They might like it in a different way. Um, often parents will try um, their children with like baby carrots. Well, sometimes they want a low fat dip with it because that just makes it all that much more delicious for them. Um, so don't give up. Keep trying. Children's tastes keep changing all the time. Um, let them help you pick and choose. Let them help prepare the fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's a great way. Let them help you make the stir-fry vegetables um, and, that, and get their feedback. Okay. Uh, we also hear sometimes parents say that their children are fussy eaters. Again, what it's, do you have to say to those parents? Um, again, it's the tastes and preferences of children. And, you know, if you keep working with children and um, don't just assume that they're not going to like something, um, you got to let them try it more often. Let them keep helping you prepare things. Um, maybe they want to help marinate the chicken. Maybe they want to help cook. Things like that, when they have a vested interest in it, um, will work. Um, I find sometimes that, you know, think outside the box. Don't just think, well, maybe they won't want um, the whole wheat bread. Keep trying things. Um, they might not like this brand of whole wheat bread, but they might like a different brand. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we hear about quite often, and uh, I've heard you talk about this before, so uh, I think this will be something that will be very helpful. Uh, we often hear how breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Uh, what are your thoughts about getting youngsters, first of all, do you believe it's the most important meal of the day? Do you think it uh, better prepares youngsters to learn? Yeah, I, there's definitely been um, a lot of um, studies done that show that students who eat breakfast do better at school. And um, one of the reasons being is when little bellies are hungry, whether they're, you know, five years old or whether they're 17 years old, um, when their little bellies are hungry and they're rumbling, that's what they're thinking about. When they're sitting in class and their stomach is empty, that's what they're thinking about. And they're getting headaches and they're not learning. And I mean, that's the whole point. We want them to learn. Um, it doesn't have to be, I think a lot of people get hung up on what breakfast should be. And you know, it has to be cold cereal with milk. It has to be, you know, whole wheat toast and a banana. It has to be pancakes and things like that. Sometimes you gotta just think out of the box. The, the two things I find, uh, kids tend to be t fussy eaters, so they don't want the pancakes and they don't want the French toast and they don't want eggs and they don't like bananas or cereal. I have fussy eaters, so I am well aware of that struggle. Um, and the other one is they don't have time, especially the older students. They don't want to get up 15 minutes before, they're rushing, they're doing their hair, um, they're getting ready for school, and they want the last possible time to sleep they can have. So there's a couple of ways to, to work with these struggles. One is if your child's a fussy eater, 
think outside the box again. Don't necessarily think that they have to have, um, you know, eggs and bacon and toast. Um, my daughter often has pasta for breakfast and everyone says pasta. And I say, well, really, what is the difference between if my child's having pasta or they're having toast? There's really not much nutritional difference. It's just we're used to, this is what you have for breakfast and this is what you have for lunch and dinner. Um, sometimes she has rice. It's just, you know, but I have something in her stomach. She's always gonna have something in her stomach before she leaves for school with, and she's a milk drinker, so in a big glass of milk. Uh, my son's more of a traditional eater, so, you know, he, he tends to pick the pancakes and the bacon and eggs and um, toast or a bagel. Um, often, though, if he's rushed and he's heading out the door, and I do this with snacks, but you can also do it with breakfast. Have granola bars on hand have Nutri-Grain bars on hand, anything cereal bars, um, because you know what, they can eat that while they're waiting for the bus at the bus stop. I package up for my son um, who plays sports all the time, and we're rushing out the door, I have the opposite, we're rushing out the door to get home from school to get to hockey, and he's hungry and he wants to eat something, and I don't want him eating chips. Mm. So we have, I bag up like on the weekends, sometimes there might be celery sticks, carrot sticks, um, cashews, peanuts, pistachios, and that's what he'll eat on the, on the fly out the door. I also make sure I have a big variety of fruits and vegetables in my house at all times. There's always grapes, um, depending on the season, a variety of, you know, we have oranges, we have right now, I think, clementines in the fridge, we have bananas on the counter, mm. we have three different kinds of apples, and we grab that to go. Um, you can do the same with your youngsters in the morning. There's nothing wrong with grabbing an apple and a granola bar if they don't have time. It's better than them going to school hungry. Mm. Peanut butter and crackers um, is a great one. You know, and that's really easy and you can just put them in a little bag and out the door you go. So there's, um, there's ways around it. You just have to get a little, you know, you have to Less deal the battle. Rigid. Yeah, and Less you have rigid. to, yeah. You just have to think of it strategically. Well, it, it you know, uh, when we talked about this the other day, it, it truly means letting go of your, your traditional breakfast foods and right. really think of it as uh, what's most important is that, that youngsters, students go to school and they're, they've got something in their stomach and, and hopefully it's of nutritional value, but right. it doesn't necessarily have to be in, within that family of, of our traditional breakfast foods. Um, right. So it, it, it makes sense, but it seems like it takes some letting go of, of our thoughts of what is breakfast food. Right. I mean, I certainly don't think that a child should have a soda and a candy bar, although I have seen that on occasion. Um, but, however, I have, um, you know, just decided that the philosophy for me is first comes that they need to eat, second, as nutritionally as possible. And I think that makes good, like, common sense and practice for all. And I think the other important thing you said, you know, going back to how do, you know, the first question I asked you about how do we get youngsters to, to eat more fruits and vegetables is, and I would think the same applies for this breakfast idea um, is let them become part of the process and the decision making process. Mm -hmm. Let them have input into what they're going to have and because they might suggest uh, that they have a bowl of soup for breakfast, um, don't reject that. Uh, instead, um, again, it's, it's getting something in their stomach and getting them fed prior yep. to them going off to school for the day. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Laura. Um, Laura is, uh, as I said earlier, is responsible for the curriculum in our schools uh, from kindergarten through grade 12 and both the uh, physical education curriculum and also the health curriculum. And uh, so tell us why it is important uh, for children to be physically active every day. Um, when the um New food pyramid came about and was developed. Um, they revised um, and added a component to the food pyramid, um, which incorporates physical activity, of which is 60 minutes a day. So the majority of our students, both in physical education and health, are um, 
being taught the importance of being physically active every day. At the elementary level, we're not as fortunate to have um, physical education class every single day. The children um, receive physical education once a week. So within the elementary classroom, we're really focusing on allowing and making the students understand that one physical education class a week isn't going to make them become more physically fit. We're a little bit more fortunate at the middle school level where the children have physical education um, for the entire school year on an every other day um, curriculum. Um, and then at the high school level, the students um, receive physical education um, in a half year um, segment, all grades 9 through 12. So it's really a challenge for me at the elementary level where I teach at the Woburn Street School to, to get that understanding across to my students um, that my one class a week isn't going to help them be physically fit. Um, and it's really become important for the children to know their bodies um, and to be able to um, leave my classroom and say, for example, today um, we had conversations um, in one class, they had about 34 minutes of physical activity, so we, we did the math, and you know, to, to their knowledge, now they know they have to go home, and they were all excited to go outside and get out in that wonderful snow that arrived yesterday mm -hmm. so that they can get out and do some running around and um, playing. And because not all children maybe enjoy being outside, being physically active, um, we talk about some of the things that they can do um, within their home that doesn't necessarily require a whole lot of equipment, um, but but works some. Um, we just talked about running in place. Um, some of them are fortunate enough maybe to be able to do some jumping um, rope in their basement or a place where their parents have de designated an indoor fitness kind of area. Um, so, but again, I'm really excited that I believe that the children in Wilmington are understanding the fact that we need to be physically active. Um, and, and keep our bodies moving and, and work towards that each and every day. Um, they're in the classroom a good amount of the time and then, you know, I'm not sure that they're um, spending as much time being physically active, but I think if they keep hearing that message over and over, it'll become more of a, an innate part of their, their daily life. Um, 60 minutes a day, that's what parents six. really need to remember. Uh, that that's really a target. That's a, a really goal. the goal. And if they can attain, you know, 80% of that, that would be wonderful. Um, I know 60 minutes sounds like a lot, but if even if they break it up into, you know, two 20-minute segments um, where they're, you know, getting a 40-minute of, of physical activity, I think it can only benefit them. One, I think it'll help um, if they're not a, a child who loves to eat really good foods, if it, it can increase their, you know, appetite um, and make them really want to eat foods that, you know, make them feel good or give them some more energy. Um, I think then that's really important. Okay. Um, um, a couple of things that you said that I'd like to ask you about. Um, sure. The, you mentioned the food pyramid. Now, yes. what is a food pyramid for those people that might not know what, what that is? Right. We have um, the children in the health class as well as in the health services as well as in the nutrition and health, um, in, the, in the food services. Um, the food pyramid is designed where the children identify the food groups, um, you know, your carbohydrates or your grains, your dairy, your fruits, your vegetables, your sweets, your fats and oils. And then, as I stated in, in the beginning of the interview, the, the component that was missing in the old food pyramid, which is now part of the new food pyramid, is that physical activity piece. Um, so children learn to identify those foods that are rich in nutritional values, um, within their health class and their physical education class so that hopefully they're able to then bring that um, little bit of information um, into their, whether it's picking out their snack for school or their after school snack or even maybe their lunchtime um, food selections. But um, why a pyramid? What's the, what's the, uh, wh why is a pyramid selected to? Uh, right, within the new pyramid, um, it, it's, it's, where they're, it's divided into segments, and, mm -hmm. and the, the larger segments of the food pyramid identify the greatest number of um, nutritional value that you want to obtain during the school day. So obviously the fats, the oils, and the sweets is very, very small, whereas your carbohydrates and your fruits and your vegetables are, are a larger part of, part of that pyramid. Okay. If I might, yes. it, it helps to um, identify for a student or anybody, or an adult, um, how many servings they should have each day. The old pyramid had just a broad, it, it said like 
five That's to eight eat. servings of fruits a day. Well, you know what? A small child doesn't necessarily need as many servings as a 17-year-old boy who's very active playing football. So they changed the whole pyramid and added physical activity, but also added the fact that you could um, put in your age and how active you are and things like that. So, you know, um, for instance, like a 17-year-old football player um, needs far more carbohydrates and grains than a, you know, 30-something plus, and we won't <laughs> say what it is, um, woman who works in a desk or an out in kitchens, not necessarily playing, you know, tackle okay. football for three hours a day. Okay. Um, Laura, um, so one of the goals since at the elementary level the students have one period a week so part of your work i think as you mentioned uh, is to give them some skills during the class period that then they can uh, continue on with after school. Right. Um, what are some of those? Uh, well, we, some of those skills, some of those activities that the kids that are most popular with the children. Right. Um, one of the, you know one of the major skills we work on um, at the elementary level is, is is jumping rope. So a lot of them can take that skill right into their home, right outside, right in the driveway, or in some instances if they have that small ba if they have that space that they can um, go to that mom and dad have said, okay, it's okay to jump rope here. Um, they can get started doing that. Some of the other things, simple, you know, working on, you know, muscle strength, um, identifying, you know, they can do some um, abdominal crunches, they can do some sit-ups, um, push-ups, um, jumping jacks, things that are just going to increase their heart rate um, and, and, you know, hopefully in the end, you know, make them feel more energized. Um, we talk all about the different um, sporting activities, you know, the summertime they have the ability to do, you know, swimming, um, within their home, bicycle riding, um, skateboarding, scootering. Um, so just to identify those things that are good for their, you know, their bodies to be to be doing, um, and not so much sitting watching television or playing video games. Um, one of the great inventions that came out was, you know, the Wii system, mm. where the Wii Sports, you know, at least the child isn't sitting playing the video games, they're up and moving and doing some of those video activities. Um, and then, of course, the Wii Fit, so they can really, um, you know, be more into like a fitness-based um, video um, activity. Um, and the children talk about that a lot. So I'd rather see them doing some of those things. Not that they, it's not okay to relax um, and have some downtime too, but um, just they're in class, they're, they're, you know, they may have one, you know, 10 minute recess a day, their lunch time. Other than that, they're, um, they're involved in a pretty full schedule within the school curriculum. So whatever they can do to benefit their physical well-being, um, I think it's a benefit for them. It makes them more alert, makes them more energized, mm -hmm. and they'll sleep better in the evening. Okay. Uh, Doreen, Doreen Crow, um, school nurse leader. And uh, in a minute, maybe we can talk a little bit about the, um, where I, when I introduced the three of you, I talked about a uh, coordinated school health and wellness program and uh, the three of you work pretty closely together uh, and we have a person who's very concerned about the nutrition uh, the physical activity and now the um, health services so tell us about the role of health that health services play in a coordinated school okay. program well, school health program the three of us are here because uh, we're in charge of the three major components of a coordinated uh, school health program. School health services is one of those major components and, and it provides multiple services to children in our schools, um, in particular to appraise, protect, and to promote health. Um, and our mission statement for school health services is to maintain school health uh, for all aspects of development so that every student will succeed in school and that's not just physically but emotionally, intellectually, um, and socially. And in order to be successful, I think that it's important for um, there to be a strong link between the home, um, the community, the school resources, and the school health office. Okay. Um, the, um, how about advice? Any advice you might have for parents uh, on just general health and wellness? Yep. 
Well, we've heard some really good advice from Mary yeah. and Laura, um, but I have three other types of advice that I could probably um, give to parents. The, the first one would be to be consistent with reinforcing messages that support healthy behaviors. Um, so it's important for parents and teachers and other adults that are in children's lives to be good role models for health and wellness. So if we eat right and we exercise, I think that our children will want to duplicate that and copy that. Um, secondly, I think that healthy behavior needs to be incorporated into daily living. So into your daily activities and your family activities. So eating right and being active shouldn't be um, it shouldn't be hard work or extra work. It should be something that sort of melds into the activities that you do um, in the family activities that you do. And then thirdly, uh, what I would strongly encourage parents to is to communicate any health services or concerns or developments of their child to their uh, building school nurse. I think that's important because that's the part that helps us to help children to succeed in school. Okay. Right. How about uh, resources that might be available for parents? Yep, there are multiple resources available um, for parents. The New England Food and Dairy Council, Massachusetts Action for Healthy Kids, uh, the John Stalker Institute of Food and Nutrition, the USDA um, Team Nutrition, and then there's the Mass, Mass Department of Public Health, um, Massachusetts in Motion program are all excellent resources for parents. Mm -hmm. Since uh, coming here, uh, a little over two years ago, it, it really impresses me to uh, serve as a member of the, um, the task force, uh, Health and Wellness uh, Committee, and just watch the three of you working together, the way you communicate, the way you, um, you know, are, are really very interested in, in serving the children of Wilmington and uh, initiating programs that um, uh, try to um, uh, make students aware of uh, good healthy habits and, and also, as you mentioned, Doreen, the, um, the whole notion of emotional health mm -hmm. as well. So uh, I'd like to thank the three of you for uh, your willingness to come here today and to tell us a little bit about what you do. and what your responsibilities are and, and particularly for the advice and suggestions that you've offered the parents. Um, if anybody in the audience uh, would care to contact uh, any of us, uh, at the bottom of the program there's a list of our names and uh, our email addresses. So uh, I would invite you to contact us with any questions that you might have and uh, thank you again for uh, tuning into In the Loop. Mm -hmm.